My name is Tessa Reinhart, and I'm a research programmer in the Kitts' lab at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. My job is a combination of computer programming, managing data collection pipelines, and analyzing data using machine learning and statistical models. Uh, this presentation is going to focus not on acoustic surveys in general, but on scaling up these surveys. So I assume you already have a general idea of how autonomous recorders work and why we use them. If you aren't familiar, Carlos's tutorial from last week gave a just fantastic overview of automated acoustic monitoring. Um, we're going to try to delve into depth about some of the things he mentioned in that presentation. These slides and the notes will be online afterwards as well. There we go. Uh, the Kids' lab is an ecology lab focused on surveying sound producing animals at large scales using acoustic recorders and automated analysis techniques such as machine learning. Between our lab and our collaborators, we use about 2,800 audiomoth recorders um, studying sound producing animals like frogs in Panama and Borneo and Montana, uh, wolves in Washington state, and birds in a variety of places, including Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Montana. So we've gotten good at two things. That's getting audio models out the door and man managing and analyzing their data when they come back. Audio models, um, I have one here, if you can see my presentation, are small, inexpensive recorders developed by a company out of the UK called Open Acoustic Devices. I'm not associated with Open Acoustic Devices. I just happen to use a lot of audio models. Um, the audio model design is open source and basically consists of a circuit board on top of a battery pack. It's very inexpensive compared to a typical autonomous recorder. It's $50 or less if you buy them in larger quantities, um, instead of $500 or even $1,000 for a more traditional autonomous recorder. If you want to learn more about audio mods in general, uh, check out the Open Acoustic Devices website, forum, and Twitter. I also wrote a guide for myself and my lab to use that contains a lot of practical information and guidelines that we typically follow when we deploy these audio mods. Uh, so that could be worth checking out as well. In automated acoustic recording, we're always working against the limitations of a recorder's battery life and its storage capacity. Of course, we're also limited by the number of recorders we have as well. The best way to deal with these limitations depends on what kind of survey you're doing. Uh, so let's talk about some of the different ways of making the most of what you've got. Uh, typically, let's say you have a long-term monitoring project and your recorders are about to run out of battery, storage, or both. Usually people go into the field and replace the used batteries and SD cards with fresh ones. With audio mods, you can switch out their SD cards while they're deployed in the field, but audio mods lose their programming when their batteries are removed. Uh, to get around that, my lab does something called a hot swap. Um, where instead of replacing the batteries in the field and programming the audio moth, we remove each spent audio moth off the tree that it's been deployed on and replace it with another fresh recorder that has already been programmed and turned on. Alternatively, instead of letting the batteries run out at a site, you might choose to only leave a recorder at a site for a few days and then move that still ready recorder to another site. Uh, of course, the type of survey you're doing will determine how long you need to leave the recorders at one site. For instance, uh, in Montana, when we're capturing frog breeding events, the recorders need to be deployed for several weeks at a time um, until it rains because these frogs breed opportunistically and vocalize so we can capture them only after it rains. In addition to what you're doing with the recorders themselves, you can also change the settings for the recordings that are being made. A well-known approach is to not record for 24 hours a day, but instead to select a specific time of day to record, 
probably when your species is most acoustically active. For instance, on the right here, I have a screenshot of the AudioMoth configuration app. This is a sort of newer, more recently released version if it looks unfamiliar to any of you who are using AudioMods. Uh, but it's out there now. Um, so I've keyed in on this app that my recorder should record between 9.30 and 12.30. Um, for audio models, one thing to keep in mind is that the time is set in UTC, which is sort of a universal or standardized time zone. So be careful to do the conversion to the time zone of your field site when you're setting up your program, if you're using audio models. Another thing that these recorders allow you to do is set a first and last recording date, uh, which you can see in this screenshot. This is a fairly new feature, but I know it'll be helpful, for instance, um, when we're deploying recorders and we don't want recorders to capture noise during the day that we are transporting them and putting them up or taking them down. Yes, okay. Within that short recording period each day, the audio moth allows you to use a sleep record cycle where the moth records for a duration that you ask for, uh, sleeps, and turns on again and record, and so on. Uh, again, this is a commonly used feature in acoustic monitoring to extend the number of weeks or even months that a recorder can be left in the field at the expense of not recording in as much depth on any particular day. Sample rate is another setting you can vary. The higher your sample rate, the larger your recording file size is. Traditionally, birds are often recorded at 44 to 48 kilohertz sample rates. But instead, to save space, I use a 32 kilohertz sample rate in my recordings. This means I can record sound up to 16 kilohertz in frequency, which is sufficient for the species I'm studying, um, typically birds because most of the energy in their sounds is below or within 10 kilohertz. At this rate, the batteries and the storage of the audio moth run out at about the same time. Otherwise, you might be more storage limited. Um, in general, the sample rate you want to pick for your study has to be twice as high as the highest frequency you want to record. Something sort of related is Bat researchers sometimes make their recordings smaller by using zero crossing recordings. These are essentially a low storage, low resolution representation of not all the sounds in the soundscape, just the loudest frequency at each time. This can work for bats, but it doesn't really work in the audible frequencies where there's a lot more noise and overlapping sounds. Another thing I get asked about a lot is triggering recordings, where the recorder is continuously listening for sound, but doesn't save the sound to the recording file um, until it hears something in the relevant frequency range. These have been used extensively for bats. Uh, number one, because there's not much noise to falsely trigger on in the ultrasonic frequencies. Uh, that's a generalization, but go with it. Number two, because when you're recording at a high sample rate uh, to record those ultrasonic calls, every bit of storage you can get matters. So those files are huge. Um, triggering is not used so much for the audible frequencies for the reverse of those two reasons. There's a lot more noise to accidentally trigger on. In okay, where was I? Anyway, storage isn't as pressing of an issue for lower sample rate recordings. Um, on the right, I have an example triggered recording set up in the AudioMoth configuration app. Um, noise below 50 kilohertz is removed, is filtered out. So the AudioMoth will only save data to the file when it records an amplitude greater than a value of 512 in the uh, 50 kilohertz and above frequency range. Effectively, this only saves data when a loud ultrasonic call happens and cuts out a lot of extraneous or silent data. Finally, 
With any recorder, you can buy larger SD cards. For the, for the AudioMoth specifically, it's also possible to attach larger batteries um, by desoldering the battery pack uh, from the circuit board and attaching batteries with a voltage between 3.4 to 20 volts. Uh, you want to attach something like a car battery, which has the right voltage, but higher amperage so the battery will last longer. Another method is to use solar panels and wireless internet, so recorders can record continuously without um, running out of power or storing a lot of data locally. The Australian Acoustic Observatory and the SAFE Acoustics Project in Borneo are both using solar panels on their recorders, and SAFE is transferring all its data in real time using 3D internet, so its recording units are more autonomous. Uh, I think that's a super awesome development that both of these places are using. Next on the docket, how do we manage all of the data that we get once our recorders come home? Now, if you're transferring all of your recordings over the internet, you don't need to transfer a bunch of data manually. But for the rest of us, there are some streamlined methods you can use to cut down on the amount of time this transfer takes. First, before even putting SD cards out in the field, you want to number your SD cards on your computer the same way you would name a hard drive so that when the SD card is connected to the computer, it shows up with that number or identification that you gave it. I'll talk more in a second about why this is important, but trust me for now. One bottleneck in the process of uploading recordings is that you can you know, attach one SD card to your computer at a time, wait for all that data to upload, and then eject it and attach another SD card. It's going to waste a lot of your time if you have to do that with dozens or hundreds of SD cards. So we created a little homemade multi-card reader called the Hexadecapus. We call it that because it has 16 arms. Each of them can hold two SD cards. Uh, you see a micro SD card, and this is also a micro SD card, but it's in a, an adapter that lets it be put into a normal SD card slot. Um, so this sort of device allows us to connect 32 micro SD cards at once, and then to run automated scripts to transfer all of their data. The automated script I use is a program called rsync, which you access through the terminal. I have an example rsync command in that audio moth guide that I mentioned earlier. So, because your micro SD cards are named, this transfer will end up creating a folder for each micro SD card named after the card with its ID and that contains the files that were saved on the card. So, nice and organized. You don't have to fiddle with it. The only time I'd recommend fiddling is uh, I think it's a good idea to double check after a transfer th that the transfer actually did create the expected amount of folders and files. It sounds basic, but it saved me a number of times. Uh, at this point, you can also see if it looks like any of your recorders failed or were programmed incorrectly. Next, where do you put all those recordings? You can use something like a network attached storage device or a NOS. We use a Synology brand NOS that holds 48 terabytes of data. That's a picture of it. It's here on the left uh, with some fancier micro SD card readers attached to it. We can access that using SSH uh, or through a GUI in a browser. Alternatively, you can just use a rack of your typical sort of backup hard drives attached to a computer. We've run out of space on this NOS, and because of the pandemic, haven't been able to get back into the lab to expand the storage on the NOS. Uh, so we're currently just using five or so eight terabyte Seagate drives to hold all of our data that are waiting. In addition to storing your data locally in at least one place, 
you also want to back it up remotely. If you work at a university that has a computing cluster, number one, good for you, very lucky. Number two, you might be able to request or purchase storage through the cluster. Large scale cloud storage services will let you do the same, just not administered by your university. Uh, both things like Microsoft Azure and more specific bioacoustics focused databases like Arbimon offer cloud storage for you know, some price. Another workaround is to use backup services. My university, for some reason, gives everyone unlimited storage on a website called Box. Uh, so we've set up our NOS to automatically upload its contents to Box, and nobody has said anything to us yet about storing dozens of terabytes there. So for now, I'm very grateful for Box. Another facet of data management is using metadata to keep track of your recordings, like which micro SD cards were paired with which recorder and where each recorder was deployed. A lot of people, myself included, use spreadsheets to manage recorder metadata. But also, audio mods are saved with some specific metadata embedded into the recording file. Um, each recording file has something called exif data. On the right, I've demonstrated how to view uh, how to view metadata of an audio moth recording using a program called exif tool. So it's exif tool and the name of the recording. Uh, you can see that all of the metadata that spits out keep track of the original sample rate, uh, the bit depth of the recording, and in this comment field things like the time and date the recording was taken, if any filters were applied, and the serial number of the audio mod. Uh, pro tip, all audio mods automatically come with a hardware-based ID number that you can view when you plug them into your computer on the audio mod configuration app. I could also edit this using exif tool if I wanted. Uh, for instance, to bring it up to date with some metadata standards. Uh, there are some bioacoustics focused metadata standards out there that you can use, which I've linked to here. Okay, now the section that probably more people have been waiting for is how do we analyze the data? Uh, the problem with answering this question in a presentation that is 30 minutes long instead of one week long, is that data analysis is not a one-size-fits-all task. It varies from completely manual to completely automated. And nowadays, most people use a combination of automated methods uh, reviewed manually by humans. As I was writing this presentation, I realized it would be really helpful to make a list of all the bioacoustics analysis software that's out there. A lot of folks on Twitter helped me compile this list linked here, uh, which organizes the currently used bioacoustics software packages by what kind of analysis tasks they can perform. Um, a lot of software packages can do multiple tasks, so I started transforming the list into a table in Google Spreadsheets. It's very much a work in progress, so if you're interested in helping out, contributing your experiences or comments on the software, or just helping fill in the table, uh, please visit that link and request edit access. Uh, just write me a note letting me know that you're not a spammer, uh, and I'll give you edit access. The two analysis tasks that people ask about the most are detection and classification. Detection means just finding a sound you may be interested in in your recordings. If you implemented auto triggering in your recordings, your detection step might be basically done. For the rest of us, methods of detection that are the most common are these four. Um, first, energy and band essentially measures the amount of sound energy in a particular frequency range or length of time or both to find vocalizations that match those frequency or time criteria 
and are louder than the surrounding background noise. So in this demonstration, I've said um, these four vocalizations in this frequency band would potentially trigger the energy and band detector, but this low one would not. Uh, next, clustering or unsupervised machine learning are cool techniques where the audio is grouped into separate categories based on its similarity. So you can see these cedar waxwing calls in this uh, idealized representation of clustering are grouped together, as well as these toey calls are also grouped together in a separate cluster. Uh, I've been told that this works great for simpler soundscapes, but I do want to warn you, if you're working with very dense soundscapes, clustering might not work as consistently for you. Next, supervised machine learning can also be used. Um, what supervised means in this context is just that people took a lot of recordings where detections were labeled as present or absent, and trained the machine learning algorithm to pick out detections in general from acoustic recordings. These are usually species agnostic, so they just tell you if something called and where it was, not what species called. Uh, for instance, I know there's a good detector for nocturnal flight calls uh, called Bird Box Detect. It also detects a lot of spring peeper calls. Uh, so it's not it's not species specific. Um, last, there's something I'll call detection through classification. This is another instance of supervised machine learning, but instead of being species agnostic, you use a species classifier that you've trained to identify different species. The classifier can take in your raw recording data and output a score or confidence for each species you're interested in. Like uh, perhaps we have a machine learning model that is semi-confident. There's a J in this recording. It's very confident there's a cedar waxwing in this recording. And it's not so sure, but there might be a toey in this recording. Uh, in detection through classification, you just split your autonomous recordings into short chunks, maybe five to 10 seconds long, run each chunk through the classifier, and let the scores that the algorithm produces guide you to which chunks contain vocalizations and which don't. There are a few other methods of detection, like image processing without machine learning. Um, I won't go over those, but to see more of those options, uh, I think you'll be able to find them on that list that I put up on the slide earlier. Next, classification. As I said, in this case, you're taking a recording and finding which species are in it. You can use clustering to classify if you, as a human, manually review the clusters and figure out what species the cluster represents. Uh, you can also use supervised machine learning. This is sort of the hot field right now, and it's what I do a lot of work uh, trying to do. Uh, it's explored in a yearly competition series called Bird Clef, Bird CLF, uh, which I recommend you check out the working notes of to see what approaches people are having success with. Um, there are a lot of different types of machine learning algorithms, but currently, in my opinion, the gold standard is convolutional neural networks. You'll also hear these referred to as uh, deep learning. Convolutional neural networks can sort of interpret a spectrogram image generated from a recording, similar to how a human would interpret that spectrogram by looking for objects or textures in the image that are species specific. You'll often hear machine learning um, in, in this category referred to as um, AI or just neural networks. Um, or deep learning, as I said earlier. Uh, but there are some other methods that fall under machine learning and AI, such as decision trees or random forests. Um, these don't necessarily rely on spectrograms, but 
and in my experience, they aren't always as powerful as deep learning. There are some other non-machine learning approaches. Uh, for instance, my colleague Sam Lapp has done a lot of work on what he calls the pulse rate analysis uh, to identify animals that make rapidly re repeating sounds like a lot of species of frogs. We have code for how to do this sort of analysis in our bioacoustics program, which we call Open Soundscape. I've linked to a, uh, a Jupyter notebook, some Python code here, which Sam demonstrated how to use that code. Sam is going to present the pulse rate method at a poster at the Ecological Society of America meeting in August, virtually. So I tried to keep to the 20 to 30 time minute, minute time limit for this talk. Um, a few previous tech tutorials will help you fill in some of the gaps in this presentation. Uh, for machine learning, there is both a tutorial focus, focused specifically on acoustic, acoustic recordings and one focused on classification of camera trap images that I thought was also very relevant to understanding the challenges that anyone faces in using machine learning, especially because when we're analyzing acoustic recordings using machine learning, we're often also using images uh, in the form of spectrograms. Carlos's talk from last week, um, this discusses things like the properties of sound, like frequency and amplitude, uh, what a spectrogram is, the pros and cons of bioacoustics and what it is. Uh, in general, it was a great presentation and I even learned new things from it, so definitely give it a look. All right, that, that's all I have for now. I wanna thank the members of our lab, including Justin Kitzes, who is our fearless leader. Uh, this work is a team effort with a lot of multidisciplinary, passionate people coming together to make it work. So I want to thank everyone in my lab, uh, Wild Labs, for inviting me to give this presentation and everyone on Twitter who has helped with all of my various like open source guide and bioacoustic software connect collection initiatives or whatnot. Uh, and of course, big thanks to our collaborators and to our sources of financial support. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tessa. Um, OK, uh, some Q&A. Uh, who's up first? Teresa, would you uh, like to jump in? Sure. Um, can you guys hear me? We mm -hmm. can indeed. Off you go. Um, I was just wondering if there's any issues that you know of with the filtering option. Um, I work with bats and so large file sizes are definitely a concern. Um, and I had heard when it first started that there might, it might've been a little buggy. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if you had any insights there. I have only tested the filtering like with clapping. Um, and I don't work with bats, so I can't say how well it works. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't really help you. But um, if you if you contact Alex Rogers or the folks at Open Acoustic Devices, they might be able to give you some updates on the status of of the triggering and if they've made fixes to those bugs. Um, yeah, Open Acoustics has a really good um, support forum as well, so um, they sh there should be someone there that can help as well. Um, uh, who is up next? Carly, you're up next with your question. Um, I know you're chatting, but um, you had questions around uh, uh, batteries in rainforest areas. Do you want to do you want to throw it into the discussion here? Uh Sure, yeah, I, I work in uh, tropical rainforests in Madagascar. And so my big thing with the audio moss was the batteries um, because I, it's very, very annoying to walk around hilly rainforests to replace all of these things. And so um, we've been trying to figure out how to effectively connect batteries while not like putting them to death, basically. Um, if you have any, or if anyone has any 
kind of tips or tricks or things that have worked with connecting external batteries to audio moths, despite everything in the world trying its best to make sure it doesn't work. What are some of the problems that you face connecting your batteries? Um, so I'm, I'm not at all an engineer and the wiring, I just assume will corrode. Like I, is there some sort of like waterproof, why like animal chew proof, uh, like wiring system type thing that like that, that's yeah, my I, so I have no experience with connecting external batteries. Um, it would be great if we could start a conversation about this on you know, one of these forums, Wild Labs or Open Computer Devices, or on Twitter to see if anyone has experience with these. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't really provide any advice, although I can't commiserate. Animals nibbling is much more of a problem than I thought it would be. <laughs> And I'll link the um, I'll link the acoustic monitoring forum in the chat if anybody wants to start that conversation there. We have a thread started for this specific episode, so feel free to drop it in there or feel free to make your own thread if you want. Uh, it's all the same community. Yeah, I think it's a pain just based on the discussion. It's a pain point um, for a lot of people. So there was another request for, <laughs> yeah, there was another request for um, a video tutorial. So our speaker next week was going to cover off some of this, these things. He's actually sick at the moment, so we're going to have a week off. Um, but we will get Eric to um, and actually Nigel as well, who's coming up in three weeks to cover off some of these things because they're super. Uh oh, Steph, you froze. Okay. Oh, um, oh there she is. There she is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> How rude. Um, sorry, I just got kicked out of the meeting. Um, uh, just to say, we'll, we'll pick them. Um, uh, so sort of, we'll try and cover some of those questions with some of our more um, engineering folk. Uh, who is next? Um, Ganesh, I think you were next around uh, in a relevant question here. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Tessa. Um, I work in Mexico and the United States borderlands, and I worked a lot with the camera traps before, and they just, uh, bears just love to destroy them. So I am just wondering if uh, you use bear-proof cases for audio mods, or do you have any experience with bears? I have more experience with bears than I wish I did. Um, I Actually, our lab just accepts the loss. Um, <laughs> we, we just allow the animals to take their sacrifice of you know one or two recorders per year. Um, there are some cases developed that are harder, like laser cut acrylic cases or uh, open acoustic devices is now selling an injection molded plastic. Did we just lose Tessa? Uh -oh. she's, she's still showing up for me. She's just frozen. Let's give it a minute. Today. Sorry, everyone. Oh, there you are. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Uh, where did I leave off? <laughs> um, essentially, there are a couple of different case options out there, and I've made a list of examples in the audio moth guide that I linked to um, that might be able to use some ideas. Um, okay, Maxine, you don't have a mic, so I'm gonna I'm going to be you. Um, what uh, Maxine jumps in and asks, uh, what analysis method would you recommend in a busy environment, e.g. a rainforest? Um, she's looking to detect primates and gunshots. Um, they were thinking clustering, but if you have some advice, she'd love to hear. With a busy environment, my recommendation is always going to be uh, convolutional neural networks. 
tipped training a convolutional neural network so that it responds in a busy environment is to um, use data augmentation, which is where you sort of mess with your training files. Um, you overlay training files on top of each other, like maybe you have a, a primate and a gunshot that you combine. Uh, so to make the neural network a bit more robust to the challenges of those dense soundscapes. Uh, I know it's very hard with uh, morning choruses where I'm located, where we have uh, like dozens of different warbler species and songbird species all singing at once. Carly, was that question related to that answer? Yes. Do you want to jump in? Oh yeah, I was just going to say what anal what analytical programs like do you can you run a CNN on like R for instance or does it have to be like Python or a more programmy language? Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. There I don't think R is can really handle a CNN training, or it would have to be um, much slower. Um, in general, I use Python, something called uh, PyTorch is the library I use. Um, there are, however, programs out there that handle the complicated coding stuff of creating a neural network for you. Um, I think Arbumon is one of those programs, and there are a couple more listed on that list. I haven't worked with those, so I don't know exactly uh, how suitable they are. Um, our lab is also working on something for our purposes called Open Soundscape, which I mentioned in the presentation, um, that lets us create convolutional neural networks using the command line and is a lot easier to use than PyTorch. There was a follow-up question um, that was just posted by someone. I don't know who your name. Uh, you, you're just a long email address. Um, Sorry, uh, it's, it's Lydia. Ah, great. Let's jump in. <laughs> um, so my question was also about the CNN. So I was just wondering. You said you um, it helps the spectrogram image, like a human was would do. Do you mean like when you extract features such as MFCCs from it, or do you like literally use the image itself? I'm a bit new to machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certainly approaches where people use MFCCs, but I'm talking about using the image itself, which oh. has a little bit more resolution. Uh, uh, I do want to correct something that I said earlier. A lot of people are chiming in that you can use R. I don't use R for anything besides statistics. So yes, you can run uh, convolutional neural networks in R, but it seems like uh, Python is probably a bit faster. Andrew, was your question related here? Do you want to jump in? Oh, no, my. Okay. Any reason PyTorch showed first TensorFlow? We did use TensorFlow for a while, and it honestly was just uh, a pain to work with. Um, I, I like the PyTorch data loader met, um, method better than. Um, trying to figure out what to do with uh, TensorFlow. Um, OK. Uh, Josh, um, you were up next. Are you still here? Uh, yeah, hi, how's it going? Hi. Hi, uh, so I had a quick question, uh, so specifically related to doing automated sound event detection. Uh, so I was mostly just curious if there's any open source uh, programs, preferably in Python, but in R potentially as well, uh, that you would recommend for doing sound event detection? Absolutely. There are plenty of programs that can do that in uh, Python, in R, in uh, just a graphical environment. Um, hopefully, I could potentially give some examples right now. Um, but it might be better for you to look at this list. Um, I'll post it in the chat. Um, I, I think there are at least 20 programs listed on this list that do detection. 
Here we go. Nice. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, Katis. Oh, I don't know if I said that right. Katsis? Uh, are you still here? Oh, sorry. That was just a response to Carly's comment. <laughs> it wasn't a question. Oh, sorry. Okay. No worries. You did have your hand up. <laughs> You did have your hand up for a, 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 a oh, second there. Sorry, you know, I was just uh, didn't understand how to ask a question, but then I asked my question. I'm Lydia. Cat. Oh, okay, oh. all right. <laughs> I didn't realize that's what came up on the thing. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. We're, we're just, today is the day where all things are going chaotically. Um, okay, there seems to be a bit of discussion going on, but I think we're at the end of our questions. Did anyone have any last questions that they wanted to ask Tessa while she's here? Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, Andre, is that for Tessa specifically or just generally to the group around audio moths? No, I think that's for the group. Okay, uh, either. Oh, Tessa, do you know anything about the new audio moths? Do they have temper temperature sensors? Yes, they, apparently they always have had temperature sensors. I didn't know this, but now they're, um, the firmware is updated so that the temperature sensing um, is saved to the uh, metadata file that comes with each recording. Cool. Ruth, did you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, yeah, great to be back here with um, asked the question last week and redirected to this conversation. So good to see you again, Tessa. Um, Ruth from Songs of Adaptation. We're a research project and we're um, doing bird classifications in Nepal, Bolivia and the U.S. Um, and, and so, yeah, we're at this moment where we have our data and we're trying to figure out a workflow for the accuracy of it, right? So the machine learning algorithm says it's 0.99959s um, correct. Uh, the threshold is what we're um, going with. And then we kind of have the experts listen to it and it ends up being about 50%. So, um, you know, whether it's actually the bird call. So I guess just a little bit of a conversation around like Tessa, like, like what does the verification process look like for you guys in terms of like manual human verification? Um, and and how does that like, we're at this moment where we're trying to turn it into action stories. So like actually being able to use this data. So, um, you know, how accurate does it have to be to be able to, for partners to use it for you guys? And does, maybe maybe that's a broad question, but thought we could chat a little bit about that. Um. My answer initially is it depends. Um, if you're surveying for one really rare species, um, maybe you want to do manual verification where you look at the highest scoring files for that species first and um, kind of listen down and until you can verify, yes, that species was there. Um, in general, judging the performance of machine learning classifiers uh, is something people have thought about a lot. And there is a specific paper by Ellie Knight that um, gives some good recommendations for um, for how to how to judge how good your classifier is. Um, anytime a classifier spits out um, an accuracy of 0.99 on your training set, it probably means the classifier is overtrained. Um, so you can deal with that by um, throwing in a bit of data augmentation or um, not training for it for as long, reducing the training rate. Um, there are a lot of different methods to deal with it. But I never like to see a classifier that thinks it has a 99% uh, accuracy. That's that's so cool. Overtrained. I will I will look into overtraining. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. By the way, I I admit I was just Googling on um, image classification in R versus Python, and I found this article that hopefully some people will find useful.
Uh, Steph, you're muted. Am I still muted? Was I muted? No, you're, you're on now. You're good. Okay, <laughs> great. Good. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, <laughs> third time. Gabriel, do you want to jump in and see if you can, uh, do you want to jump in and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, you're a bit choppy, but yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, um, so I'm dealing with birds and bats in the Peruvian Amazon, and I was wondering, um, I've looked into a lot of CNN papers um, for audio classification, and um, I'm wondering for super unsupervised or supervised learning, um, what are the standard feature extra extraction methods? I've seen MFCCs, um, but are there other um, ways or do you just ever input the entire audio signal unfiltered? We typically don't input the entire audio signal, but we do input the entire spectrogram and the feature extraction in a convolutional neural network is literally um, the convolutional layers. Um, so it's considered that they extract features from the spectrogram and learn how to interpret them. Um, then you have some classification layers at the end, which um, you know, figure out how to deal with the features that have been extracted. So the key is that you're not personally extracting features. You're letting the neural network um, decide the best way to extract and interpret images based on your data. Um, typically, you want to start with a pre-trained feature extraction layer like um, convolutional neural network architectures like ResNet um, come with weights for the convolutional layers pre-trained on, um, on ImageNet, which is sort of a standard uh, data set. Does, does that start to answer your question? Yeah, um, it does. It seems like you're sort of um, making this into a, an image classification problem, maybe because there's more resources for that, stuff like that. Yeah, image classification is how we approach this problem now. Though we, we did spend a lot of time using, I mean, we spent a year using um, template matching and random forests. Um, and it, we really convinced ourselves that image classification was a more powerful way to deal with these data. Interesting. OK, got it. And um, as far as low pass and high pass filters, it, or I guess if you're just the problem that I'm having now is that our audio moth data is is sampled at 384 kilohertz. Um, so there's, yeah, I, I just, um, I don't know exactly uh, what sort of filtering to, to do um, pre-processing, but um, I'm sure I'll just test test things out and figure it out. The, the thing I can imagine you running into challenges with, with such a high uh, sample rate, is uh, the resolution of your images is going to be smaller if you input the whole thing as like a, a, a 224 by 224 image into your convolutional neural network. Um, one approach that, I mean, I haven't tried because I don't work with such high sample rate recordings, would be to um, cut up the image into frequencies relevant for birds and frequencies relevant for bats, and then train separate classifiers, one for birds, one for bats. Um, that should get you a little bit more expansion in the frequency ranges that are relevant uh, without you know, squishing up all of your audio into a few rows of your spectrogram. Um, OK, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Okay, if there are no final questions from anyone, I think Pascal was the last. Oh, wait, sorry, Gabrielle. Oh my goodness, I'm confusing everyone's names today. Chaos. Um, um, I'm going to wrap us up. Um, okay, good. Wonderful. Um, so thanks, everyone. And thank you so much, Tessa. That was awesome. Um, and Thank you for being patient through uh, a little bit of chaos and technical 
some technical difficulties. Um, uh, thanks everyone. Like I said before, we are having a week off next week because our speaker um, is sick. So we're going to rearrange our schedule later in the series so that we can pick Eric's talk up later down, down the line. Um, so a week off. We may organize a tech happy hour. We'll see. Stay tuned. Um, there's been, yeah, exactly, Carly. There's been some requests for just a, a casual little meeting at a more convenient time for some other people. So we'll see. Um, we'll, yes, we'll everyone stuff. watch Twitter because if we if we do a happy hour, I will put the links out on there. We probably we're not going to do like a registration through Eventbrite. Um, it'll just be something that we tweet out. So just make sure you're following us. Um, I'll let you know next week if it's happening. Yeah, so it'll be on Twitter. It'll be on Wild Labs if you're not on Twitter as well. Um, so thank you very much, Tessa. Um, yes, Drew, we will post. Uh, so for everyone benefit, we will post um, the recording of this uh, tutorial to YouTube tomorrow. You will find uh, the we will update the collaborative notes by tomorrow and capture all of the discussion that's happened in the chat. So it's all really easy for you to access. Thank you, our pleasure, Drew. Um, and uh, we'll post yeah, the YouTube recording tomorrow um, and everything will go up on Wild Labs. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, and if you want to hang around, we stop recording, but we generally have a little chat. So if anyone wants to hang out and like talk tech, um, you're most welcome. So, but otherwise, thanks everyone. Lovely to see you all and we'll see you in two weeks.